Now that you know how to write net redox reactions, let's look at some of the applications of redox that occur in our everyday life. First, some vocabulary. An electrochemical cell is a cell which involves the transfer of electrons between matter. So far, you have been taught how to build a galvanic cell, which is for spontaneous redox reactions. This is where chemical energy is transformed into electrical energy. And an example would be assembling a battery such that when the electrons flow from the anode to the cathode, we can do something such as light a light bulb. There's another type of electrochemical cell. This is called an electrolytic cell, and this is for non-spontaneous reactions. In electrolytic cells, electrical energy is converted into chemical energy. An example would be running electricity into water in order to make hydrogen gas and oxygen. In this cell, the electron flow is still from the anode to the cathode. Now, why would you want to make hydrogen? Well, maybe you'd like it as a very clean alternative to gasoline, and there are hydrogen-fueled cars out there now. Everyday redox chemistry can be good things that we want. These would be things like batteries, rechargeable batteries, and electrolytic cells. It can also be unwanted things, like corrosion. Some of our oldest battery technology is the alkaline battery. These would be the double A's or triple A's that you might find in your calculator, or C and D batteries, which are in larger toys and flashlights. They are called alkaline batteries because they involve hydroxide, which means that their environment that they operate in is basic. Shown here are the two redox reactions involved. Let's get the oxidation states for the top reaction. You notice that zinc is going from zero to plus two. The zinc is being oxidized, so this is naturally the anode compartment. Let's look at the bottom reaction now. We'll get the oxidation states, and we're going to focus on the manganese. The manganese goes from plus 4 to plus 3, so it is reduced, and this, therefore, is the cathode compartment of the battery. This is a very clever design, because you notice that hydroxide goes in for the zinc reaction and comes out in the manganese reaction. So we don't necessarily need a liquid junction because this cell maintains electrolytic balance as it operates. If you were to open up your typical C or D battery, this is what you would see. You would see this electrolytic paste. This is the manganese compound that we're reacting with and making. You would see that your anode of zinc metal is here on the bottom. And how do the electrons flow? Well, they're going to flow out the anode through whatever we hook it up to and come back in through the cathode. Now, you can't use a paste as a cathode. So instead, we have graphite. This is what's known as an inert electrode. It's used to move the electrons, but does not change oxidation state. This is, of course, an extensive reaction, so batteries will keep for quite some time, but they will eventually decay over time as some molecules get enough energy to get over the energy of activation. This might explain why batteries are somewhat hot when they operate. Another classic type of battery is the button battery. These would be in your watches. It's the same technology for the anode. This is a zinc solid that is oxidized to zinc 2 plus. But the technology in the cathode involves silver. Here, silver ion is reduced from plus 1 to 0. And silver is a bit more expensive than manganese. So this might explain to you why button batteries tend to be rather expensive. If you were to cut open a button battery, this is what you would see. 
Once again, we have the zinc as our anode and the electrons flow to our load, and then they get to here where our silver oxide paste is. And there is a bit of a separator or liquid junction that allows the hydroxide from one side of the reaction to flow to the other side. And of course, here is our net redox reaction. Car batteries are rechargeable. A car battery is actually a series of two volt batteries in a line of six to give us a 12 volt battery. And they're very toxic. They involve lead and sulfuric acid. Lead can have several oxidation states, zero, plus two, or as you'll see in a moment, plus four. The anode involves lead being oxidized to lead sulfate as a plus two oxidation state for lead. The cathode involves lead four oxide being reduced to lead sulfate. So here is what your battery would look like inside. You have a frame full of spongy material, which holds our lead as an anode, and then the next frame holds your powdered lead oxide cathode, and then another anode and cathode, and so on, until we've achieved 12 volts. You need a car battery to start your car. So your car battery is a galvanic cell when discharging. It changes chemical energy into electrical energy. But while the car is running, a part called the alternator recharges your battery and runs the reaction in reverse, using electricity to turn chemicals into higher energy chemicals, which we can use again the next time we need to start the car. Nowadays, battery design is a lot more sophisticated. You're probably familiar with the lithium ion battery. So this involves lightweight lithium ions and inert carbon electrodes and different concentrations of lithium ions. The amount of power a battery can generate compared to its mass is very important. You couldn't have a drone with a lead acid battery because that only provides 25 watt hours per kilogram. You have a better shot using a nickel metal hydride battery, but look what a lithium ion battery does for us. Six times the power for the amount of mass. So what does it look like when we're charging it? The electrons flow into the anode, which attracts the lithium ions. We get a greater concentration of lithium ions here on the left side than on the right side. Then when we want to use our lithium ion battery, the lithium ions start migrating from left to right and in doing so, release electrons from the anode. Nickel metal hydride batteries are a little bit difficult to explain based on the chemistry that you know so far. Let's just leave it at they involve nickel and hydrogen and also some rare earth elements. So mostly nickel, a little bit of iron, a tiny bit of cobalt, and then these rare earth elements. Well, guess where rare earth elements are found and mined in the globe? China. We have some in the United States, but we are reliant on trade to make sure that we have the rare earth elements needed for nickel metal hydride batteries. So we have come a long way in terms of kilowatt hours per kilogram with longer runtime, but that also comes with higher cost. The next iteration of batteries is the lithium metal batteries, and perhaps you realize that because these are considered very dangerous and not allowed to be on airplanes or college dorm rooms. This is because lithium is an alkali metal, and much like sodium, alkali metals react very exothermically with water to form hydrogen gas, which is, of course, flammable. 
If you have a few minutes, check out this video of some fun dropping of alkali metals in water. So it may be that we're all in the matrix and we can be batteries. After all, do we not digest chemicals and do a redox reaction? So as you sit here watching this video, you might be digesting breakfast, you're inhaling, you're exhaling, and your bladder is filling up because you're making water. You're doing respiration. Let's look at the oxidation states of the elements involved in this redox reaction. Delta G naught for this combustion reaction of a simple sugar is minus 2,867 kilojoules per mole. We also know that delta G naught is equal to minus N F E naught for the cell. So if I know delta G naught, the Faraday constant, and the moles of electrons transferred, I can figure out how much we are worth as a battery. There are six carbon atoms going from oxidation state zero to plus four. So that is a 24 electron transfer. When you plug that in, it turns out that we make a 1.24 volt battery. What do we do with that energy? Well, we don't necessarily supply electricity. We convert, we convert 38 ADP to 38 ATP. We're storing that chemical energy and moving it around in our bloodstream to where it is needed so we can move. This is 40% energy capture efficiency. What are we doing with the other 60%? Well, we're warm-blooded and we keep a steady temperature. That's part of it, for sure. It turns out we are designed better than a non-hybrid car, which only captures 25% of the energy of burning gas. Hybrid cars capture about 40%, and electric cars are even better. So here is your last question. Which redox reaction below is found in a button battery? Now I will assure you that all these are the correct reactions. I'm not gonna throw a reaction at you that involves the chemicals, but wrong coefficients. But if you remember, a button battery is kind of expensive. What other metal is expensive? And I bet you can identify an alkaline battery as well as one of the choices and a car battery. The last choice you haven't seen yet, that will be in the next lecture.